the weekly SETI seminar series. Today we are joined by uh, Margaret Race, who works here at the SETI Institute as a principal investigator. Margaret got her uh, BA in biology from uh, UPenn and then a, a master's in energy management and policy, policy from the same institution. Uh, and then she moved to uh, California to UC Berkeley to do a PhD in zoology, specializing in ecology. Uh, then she did a postdoc uh, at Woods Hole, uh, and then uh, she was at Stanford in the human biology uh, uh, department where she was an assistant professor. Uh, she then moved to the uh, UC system to the offices of the president in Oakland, where she was uh, principal science policy analyst in the division of agriculture, uh, before going back to UC Berkeley, where she was um, uh, among uh, several jobs she did there was she was assistant dean for planning college uh, for planning at the College of Natural Resources. Since 1991, she's been at the SETI Institute as a principal investigator. She's, her career interests have focused in, in this part of her career around planetary protection, uh, environmental uh, impact analyses of space flight, uh, and also risk communication and policy. Um, as part of that, she's going to give, give a talk today uh, on UN policy and space policy. So if you'll uh, join me in welcoming Margaret. Am I on? OK, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to you about the kind of work I do upstairs, um, by and large. And um, this one is a little bit of a, the, the title was uh, Updating Policies for Space Exploration and Use, but it's really a race for space. Scientists have been here for a long time, and the commercial uh, industry and ventures are starting to think beyond just Earth orbit, and there's things happening. So what I want to do with you today is share um, how I think the, ro the rules for the road in space are changing quite a bit. Um, and it's getting kind of crowded. And for now, for a long time, we've had the Outer Space Treaty for 50 years has been a really remarkable piece of international law. And um, there's an interesting duality in the way that it's played out that um, only dawned on me in the past couple of years. What we've had is kind of a divided road. So down in low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit around Earth, we have all of the complex mix of people out there. And the scientists have been really the only ones on the moon and beyond. And so what does that mean when now everybody's converging to go further away? So this divided road is soon going to end in ways that we have to look at how we want to manage space. And we've got a big merge ahead. These two communities are coming together, wanting to use the same resources for all laudable purposes. And we're starting to see initial steps being taken in the legal community and elsewhere. And there's lots of need for scientific input, but there's also need for other kinds of input. So um, that's the overview of the talk. And um, what happens, I think, is a lot of us have a, the sense of, say, the legal community and the support network we have, with, whether it's NASA or any place else. We just go along our own way on that road that we're on, and everything's fine. We know how to drive our car. We know how to do everything. Um, it's good to think sometimes about the rules of the road and where they came from. And ours, actually, the, the uh, guidelines for law and science at the final frontier, space, actually began in the Cold War. So the Outer Space Treaty began when about the time when Sputnik went, went up. And the um, international community of biologists began realizing, among other things, that um, when you launch a spacecraft, you're launching Earth life, microbial nonetheless, Earth life. And if you're going to other places to look for life, the last thing you want to do is take it with you. And also, it was at the height of the Cold War. And the US and the Russians wanted to make sure that we sort of did things be nice. And so we set out these policies that basically said, you don't mess up my science, and I won't mess up yours. And the NASA was started about that same time. The International Geophysical Year had happened then, so we started seeing a lot more discoveries, even the, radi um, the Van Allen radiation belt, um, looking down at Antarctica. Lots of studies that were really planetary-wide studies occurred at that time. And the Antarctic Treaty was getting going at the time. And also, we had the beginnings of NASA and the Project Mercury. So what came out of this was outer discussions that led eventually to the Outer Space Treaty. And like Antarctica, we 
you could define what the area was, but it was a lot more diffuse. We didn't just have a continent and its margins in the sea. We had an area that was outer space that we could say included the moon and other celestial bodies, and the orbital areas, and just everything out, out through the solar system. And in 1967, the treaty came into force, but already back around pre-Sputnik time, the deliberations happened on what the legal principles should be for this treaty. Those were decided in 62. And the big thing about no nukes in space, that was probably, that's why the Outer Space Treaty is so important. What it said is, and there are now over 100 countries that have signed it, peaceful activities in space, science exploration and use for the benefit, the peaceful benefit of humankind, no sovereign claim, no one owns it, no military activities or bases. It doesn't mean that military can't be up there doing remote sensing and watching things and monitoring, but no military bases. No nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction um, in orbit. Orbit around Earth or any other planet. International cooperation and assistance, freedom of access and exchange of information. Jurisdiction by the states. It means that any signatory party, any state country that signs it, still has a responsibility to control and approve the activities of those who live in that country. Meaning that it's for launches and activities in space by government agencies and non-government entities. And that little piece is going to come back later on, and I'll show you. And um, the states bear the liability for damages. The states maintain ownership of the assets that they launch. And the whole idea also was included to um, avoid harmful contamination and adverse changes to the Earth. Harmful contamination of where we're going and concern about Earth when we come back. And all of this is done through the UN um, it's a UN treaty, and so the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space is one of the largest UN committees and still operates today. What's interesting from a scientific perspective is that it, the treaty is for science, exploration, and use for the benefit of all mankind. And as I said, that to me was the treaty until I realized the geopolitical underpinnings of it. We don't want to change that treaty because it is so important in terms of international Cold War um, relationships and the, the changes that and the agreements that we have about no nukes in space and no weapons. So we do have in this treaty though, um, it's approach in Article 9 about planetary protection, avoiding harmful contamination of bodies and adverse effects on the of Earth when we bring things back. And it's kind of like environmental protection for the solar system. What we're saying is when you go there, do responsible exploration. When you come back, don't do anything that would harm Earth. It just stands to reason. And when it has played out, this is the reason behind what's called planetary protection. The Outer Space Treaty says specifically in Article 9, no harmful cross-contamination. What does that mean? And so for the scientists, who have been the only ones going beyond Earth orbit for all these years, it has meant avoiding forward contamination. Don't send hitchhiker microbes on the spacecraft you're sending to Moon, Mars, or any place else until you're sure that there isn't another organism up there that might be extraterrestrial. And don't bring anything back as a hitchhiker or a sample or an astronaut without being sure that you've tested to make sure that it is not harmful in any way to Earth. So where the Planetary Protection Office within NASA and a whole scientific community have asked, how do you translate those treaty statements into policy? So think of it like, thou shalt have clean water. What does that mean? That's what the law says. And then scientists within EPA and other agencies determine, well, swimmable water, fishable water, drinkable water, what's the impact on an endangered species? So the definitions of clean water are different. And the standards one might set might depend upon whether you're looking at, say, do you set the standards on someone who's uh, the average citizen, a male average citizen? Uh, immunocompromised one, how do you figure out what those are? So that's all science. And then that's science with judgments, risk assessments of different sorts. That include things like views about microbiology, views about public health, views about the cost that it would take to do something like that. So we're constantly revising these um, standards, if you will, as we learn more science. So not surprisingly, within the last 10, 20 years, there have been lots of changes as we've learned a lot more about microbes. So if you look at Outer Space Treaty, 
And if you look at Moon and beyond, the only ones that have gone there, by and large, have been scientists and government launching nations. And for all the years of the Outer Space Treaty, all 50 years or so, planetary protection has been a part of it and has been very much followed. From the time we brought back lunar samples in the Apollo mission, they were quarantined in what is now referred to as BSL-4, Biosafety Level 4 containment labs. And those, really, NASA and Center for Disease Control were the early ones thinking about microbial contamination of that sort. This is a photograph of the Pathfinder mission in the 90s, the small um, rover that was the size of about a microwave oven. And that one was cleaned very, very well before it went up to Mars. And this is the back shell of the MSL, Mars Science um, Laboratory, that was just launched, uh, that landed last year, and has the large Curiosity <laughs> rover, the rover that's the size of a Mini Cooper car and weighs a ton. That too was cleaned, at very, and the number of spores on this rover and the large rover uh, both meet standards. So the cleaning ability that we have is really remarkable. So as far as science activities in outer space, Astrobiology is guided by um, exploration and new understanding. We want to dwell there. And really, we're understanding the environment, searching for evidence of extraterrestrial life with any way we can. We're using radio astronomy far away. We're looking at Kepler, the extrasolar planets, um, looking out there for habitats and whether something might be habitable. And when we're in the solar system, we can go there. We can do experiments. We can bring things back. We are touching and poking and probing in ways that allow a direct contact in real time for habitats, for potential life, and for our spacecraft. So all the time, we have had strict controls. Now, some people might push back on planetary protection, saying all it does is it's like the environment. Here come the environmentalists. Let them go away. I want to do my job. Um, actually, right now, the strict environmental controls, the strict planetary protection controls, apply only to Mars, Enceladus, and Europa. Others still have any other body, whether it's an asteroid or a comet, if you're collecting dusts out there, if you're going to the moon. We know enough to say the probability of finding life there is very, very, very low. You still want to contain materials, but you know what? The scientists want to contain materials because they want to bring back pristine samples. And sometimes the scientific containment is, is as strict or stricter than the um, planetary protection containment. So this is where we are. We've got really strict controls with a sense of we're going to take care of Mars and Celadus and Europa because they really do have what we believe is the potential for habitability. Contrast that to the Outer Space Treaty. Again, a completely the same treaty, but now it's like the divided highway. If you look at closer to home, what's going on in Earth orbit, the Outer Space Treaty, the same set of laws and articles, is implemented differently. We have uh, low Earth orbit as a habitat, geostationary orbit, launches. Um, we've got a lot of different stakeholders. We've got launching nations. We've got human missions going up there. We have scientists that are interested, satellite launchers, commercial, private folks, partnerships of all different sorts. And if you look at the legal issues that they work on, they're completely different. First of all, no planetary protection in low Earth orbit or any of the Earth orbits. They issue, their, the part of the treaty that impacts them legally is things like liability, harmful interference, ownership of launched assets, rescue of astronauts and mutual aid, um, ownership and assignment and monitoring of orbital frequencies or um, assets where your satellites are up there. Space debris and the concern that we have of lots of material up there that is really crowding things out and could um, cause problems for astronauts in space station or for other materials that are launched, and even launch licenses. And right now what we have is not a single group for planetary protection. It's COSPAR, Committee on Space Research, a group of scientists that is the one that oversees what's going on in planetary protection and reports to the United Nations. If you look at outer space, in the divided highway down in our Earth orbit, what you have just for the US, you have uh, Commerce, NASA, NOAA, you have FAA getting in on licenses, and you have private launches. Oh, and you also have military. So Vandenberg launches things, uh, Cape Canaveral Air um, Station launches. And, so, and those are launches that are consistent with the treaty, um, that there's no military activity, no 
um, aggressive type activity. So the scorecard for the Outer Space Treaty beyond Earth orbit, I'd say in Earth orbit we've done a great job, and we, we use Earth orbit in many different ways, and there's a lot of cooperation. Even something like when you go to Earth, uh, the International Space Station, if you are in the American module, American laws apply. If you are in the Japanese module, Japanese laws apply. It's just like when you go on a flagship, an airplane, an airliner, if you launch, if you take off and go across the ocean, and I was on a flight once where a baby was born, the baby is um, the citizen of the, well, the parent's country, of course, but the flagship. So this baby was born on United Airlines, and it was an American citizen. So that's just the way, and it, it's, it comes from navigation law. So navigation law feeds into aerospace, uh, aviation law, which feeds in, not surprisingly, lead to um, uh, aerospace law. So when we look beyond Earth orbit, we're saying the emphasis on biological contamination. We don't want to launch something that will mess up our science. and We want to be careful of the organics that we send up there because when we're looking for life, we're looking for carbon chemistry and organics. We've been able to update it with new science findings, and it's been really good for protecting science during our exploration. That's why we have all these wonderful science announcements that are made about what's going on on Mars, for instance. However, the treaty is mute on resource utilization and environmental management. It says nothing. Planetary protection refers to harmful contamination, and that has not been defined in terms of how you use the, the environment. There is no code of conduct. There's no environmental impact statement process, environmental impact assessment like it's done in, say, Antarctica. And so now we're at a crossroads. There's lots of challenges coming along on the horizon. And the question is, how do we involve stakeholders? Very often, what I see when I'm in talking with scientists is the scientists know, and they're going to set the standards. And actually, at an ABSICON meeting, I talked about some of these other proposals to use outer space. And a postdoc got up and said, how do we just stop all those people? And I say, you can't. Because the treaty says outer space is for exploration and use. And those three little letters are just looming large. So let's look at some of the things that are coming down the pike. We've got new commercial groups who are focusing beyond low Earth orbit. And admittedly, it'll be a while. We've got Lunex, which set itself up. Um, it's wanting to be like a commercial delivery service. We'll take your science instruments, we'll take whatever you want, and bring it to the moon's surface. And the idea is we'll run it like an airline. Um, here, modern day um, gold rush for platinum, for water, for different uh, resources that are out there in um, asteroids. And this one is Planetary Resources Incorporated. Bigelow Aerospace is talking about floating hotels out in space. Now this one is Earth orbit, but not too long before going to um, the moon or beyond. SpaceX has had wonderful launches to the International Space Station. They've demonstrated suborbital, now orbital, now return, return from the um, space station, and soon perhaps bringing astronauts up there. It, it's just a matter of time. And they, not surprisingly, have also come even to SETI Institute saying that they want to use their cargo capsule, which they're going to ISS with now. And they are also envisioning the same capsule could be modified to be used for people. People to International Space Station and people beyond. And they're talking about a 2018 uh, launch to Mars with a unmanned robotic capsule. And then perhaps 2023 or 2025 to Mars with people. Or how about this one? And they must be serious because they're already selling mugs and t-shirts on their website. <laughs> Mars One, which is a group of Dutch entrepreneurs who have set themselves up as a um, nonprofit organization, but with commercial partners, basically they said, let's think of what we can do and think about how far we could go. And they said, we know how to get to Mars. We know how to do all these wonderful things. And the MSL mission just showed you that you can land something that's real heavy and do retro rockets coming down onto Mars despite its thin atmosphere. So what they said is, we know how to do everything except come back. So let's do one-way missions to Mars with people. They're saying 2013, desert tests on Earth to, and selecting and training the crew. So just think of someone like Pascal Lee here at SETI Institute who's going up to the Arctic and doing all sorts of wonderful simulations of space exploration. And we learn a heck of a lot by doing that. They're talking 2016 and 2018, the launches of the first supply units. 
and an autonomous rover that would actually choose the web, the site where the, um, the habitat would be built and actually start to build some of these modules. You could do, have a robot do that. 2021, six launches where the building units go up and this is how they're doing some of the funding, TV broadcast, 24-7, 365, watching them build something on Mars. And then 2023, the first four humans arrive on Mars. So launch them in 2021, La land them on, uh, and then every two years, the 26 month launch window, send up four more people and build a community. And this is not a suicide mission. None of these people that talk about one way missions are talking suicide missions. What they're saying is, oh, okay, I've, I'm grown, I've got my children on their way, and I love science. And some would say, the, one of the neatest things I could do would be one of the first people to get to Mars and to live out my life sending back data and doing science up here. And I have to die anyway, so why not there? It's not so different than someone that would go to Mount Everest or Columbus who came across the ocean. There are plenty <coughs> of examples of something like this. And the science and policy <coughs> questions do come into the planetary protection realm. What does it mean to have humans up there? And COSPAR has said that humans can go up there, but maybe what you do is you have to do thorough examination of an area and designate an area as a human site because you know there's no life there. And whenever you go into new areas, you go in robotically first. So there's ways you can do that, just as when we go down deep into the ocean, we may want to get out there and look at those the vent worms and clams and things, but chances are you do it from inside you are contained submersible, and you use robotic arms to get things. So there's ways to use technology to go there and still not contaminate. And there are non-science questions. If it's planned as a one-way mission, how do you get informed consent on something like that? What other issues come up? What are our obligations on here on Earth to sustain somebody who voluntarily chooses to go someplace like that? So there are many things that come up. Just about two weeks ago, Dennis Tito, who already spent $20 million to go up in a Russian spacecraft to the International Space Station, announced that he wants to do a privately funded <coughs> Mars mission to take advantage of a, uh, the alignment in 2018 where Mars is very close. And he can do a flyby mission of Mars, 501 days round trip, and uh, a crew of two, and he suggests a married couple. Um, some have said, mm, two years in. <laughs> in something the size of a car with your spouse. And he, he really sees it as a mission for America. He has a chance to do some new technology, uh, test some of these uh, inflatable type of capsules and, and habitats. And he figures it's, it's a chance to give us a shot in the arm, much like the Apollo mission did. When Kennedy talked about going to the to moon, um, people were skeptical that, that it could ever happen in 10 years. But really, we could do it if we wanted. Then there's the Golden Spike Company, uh, a Colorado-based company um, that one of uh, co-run by Alan Stern, formerly of NASA. That is planning round trips to the moon by 2020 for science and tourism. And it's, it views its customers, if you will, as governments, businesses, people, and it's only $800 million to go to the moon. Uh, and if you don't have that much, it's only 450 if you want to do an orbital trip. Um, and so he's, their company is saying, we can get there, we know how to do it, and we can sell space to others that, that don't have an opportunity to do it. And maybe other governments are those. So if you look ahead, space exploration is really in transition, and we have new players, new locations, diverse activities, and all of it's coming soon. And now we've got people talking as early as 2018. That is really soon. We've got orbital ideas, and now the FAA has licenses for human space flight. So you get your launch license and your landing license from the FAA, but FAA doesn't have any authority or sets of regulations about what to do when you get up there. Commercial vehicles, and um, we've got pretty, the government's a real set about that. Um, people are talking about propellant depots and refueling space stations in space at the Lagrange points, uh, orbital hotels and tourism. Uh, a con company is also saying we've got this real problem with space debris, so how about a space garbage collector? Go up there and somehow find a way to either remove materials, deorbit them, 
boost them up to a higher or orbit where they won't be a problem, or even reuse the parts. So people are looking at that. Um, there's a Swiss company saying, well, I know that the Chinese don't want the Americans to get their satellites, so we're neutral, we'll take care of everything. So there's lots of ventures and ideas out there. The moon, bases, in situ resource utilization of water ices, helium-3 for fusion. Strip mining has been a proposal. Um, no one's really talked about waste disposal. Um, even NASA Ames is talking about synthetic biology. You don't have to lift up all of that mass for building habitats. You can send up microbes. You've got plenty of regolith, and you've got ices. Melt the ice, put it together, you've got adobe. You have organisms that can help you make your construction materials. Someone has also done a, a proposal on astro burials, and already Eugene Shoemaker, uh, the famous geologist, is, has some of his ashes on the moon. Um, that raises questions about cultural issues because some native communities feel the moon is sacred, and the idea of deliberately impacting into a moon, even to do good science, is not something that they like. So we're running into claims of even rights. People saying, if you want me to go up there and do mining, I have to have right to that material. Now you bump into the moon treaty, which has some problems. And even SETI. SETI's talking about making the far side of the moon be for radio silence and better viewing and listening into deep space. Um, who's to say the scientists should get it? Maybe somebody else has a better use. How do we adjudicate that? And certainly on Mars, I've talked about the issues. But there are people even talking about homesteading. If I go there and stay a long time, someone should give me um, the deed for that property. Homesteading like we did in this country. But who? Because no country has sovereignty over outer space. So the way I see it now, we're, we're at a point of a paradigm shift. And the lawyers and the United Nations that are thinking about issues of within uh, Earth orbit, they talk about, let's think about updating the United Nations Treaty for space sustainability in the long term. Terrific idea, but they're really looking at orbital assets and what's going on on Earth, remote sensing, storm prediction, things like that. We, the scientists, have been like kids in a play in a sandbox up on the moon and beyond. And we play nice, and we've got a good set of rules, and everybody respects them. And now we're talking about these other guys with their heavy equipment coming in, and we're talking not just science for pristine um, samples and general knowledge, but doing things, commerce, and using the moon, using Mars. And that's allowed under the treaty. So what we've got is a new mix of stakeholders and activities that are coming up, and we can anticipate where the potential conflicts come and where the policy gaps might be. What we're asking is how to merge it. And the lawyers and the international diplomats think about one set of things. And I think that they have a view that is very skewed towards their divided highway of low Earth orbit and Earth orbit. And some of the questions of the scientists aren't even coming at the, to the table. So we're all still within the space treaty, but we've got this big merge coming up. So is there a way to anticipate it? and to think about the impacts, and to think about the ramifications. And we're seeing issues that go beyond just the science. Um, for instance, the one-way missions, for instance, or the, the questions about cultural heritage and the moon. We need more than just science and scientists to answer and address these questions. And we've got gaps in policy that we can see. For instance, right now on Mars, planetary protection is firmly in place. Anybody that would launch would have to come through, in our case, NASA's Planetary Protection Office. When you go to the moon, Planetary Protection doesn't hold except for you write a letter that says you want to go to the moon. You show them that what it is you're going to do. And there's nothing about Planetary Protection that we have to worry about anymore. Unlike the Apollo days, we didn't know if there was life there. Now we know there isn't. Planetary Protection doesn't step up. So there's a whole gap within the moon, for instance, on environmental management. What do we do? Does that mean anybody can do what they want? We certainly want to build on existing laws and ethics and um, codes of conduct and such. But it turns out that all the laws that we have on this planet are based on life as we know it, all of the ethical systems, the foundational parts of the law, what is right or wrong, and even the theological systems are built on life as we know it. There's two other laws, the Antarctic Treaty and the Law of the Sea Treaty, that were both, um, all three of these laws were formed around the same time, and they are the only laws in the world 
that deal with truly international spaces. Everything else is territorial. Everything else is between a couple of countries, multiple countries. And this, these were attempts to deal with international spaces. And um, actually, Dwight David Eisenhower, in his inaugural address, said that we should use the Antarctic Treaty as an example for dealing with international spaces. So how do we address this? How do we know what's right or responsible when we're thinking about these areas beyond Earth? How do we balance the interests and uses? And we've got Coast Parts doing a great job, but um, what if we find life out there? Carl Sagan at one point said, if we find um, extraterrestrial life, and it is Martian, and it is microbes, does Mars belong to the microbes, to the Martians? Good question. So we're starting to see early attempts to fill these gaps incrementally, a piecemeal approach. And I'm not thinking that they're bad necessarily, but they are different. So to an example, um, Coast Bar, the commercial private lunar space missions that have been formed around a Google Lunar X Prize, and ethical considerations that have come up in the question of what if we find extraterrestrial life on Mars. Let me quickly take you through some of these. So the Google Lunar X Prize was set up in 2007, and it is a prize that is an incentive prize, much like was done when Lindbergh and the early aviators were going across the Atlantic or flying round trip around the moon, around the Earth. And they got money prizes, and some of those trophies are on view at the uh, Air and Space Museum. You can still see some of those early prizes. So the Lu Lunar Prize is for commercial, privately funded spacecraft to go to um, the moon. And it is only can have up to 10% uh, government money. So it's really a 90% private venture. 2016, as of December 2010, I think they're down a couple more since then, $30 million in prizes have been put up. And the deadline to do it is the end of 2014. So we really got to start to see some action soon. And the challenge is to land a robotic spacecraft on the moon, rove at least 500 meters, and send back the signal. And there's a bonus. $5 million to a team who would send um, to, would go to a previous human site, so considered a human heritage site, the Apollo site, someplace where humans have been in the past. And um, that raises questions about preservation. So the anthropologist and historians began to say, wait a minute, this, the Apollo landing sites, and our going to the moon are monuments to humankind's technological prowess. You wouldn't think of going and wrecking the pyramids. You wouldn't think of going and doing something to the Grand Canyon, for instance. And that isn't even, uh, that's just natural. So how do you decide what to do in this case? So interesting, NASA pulled together, the, um, the commercial folks pulled together a set of workshops. And they said, let's take a look at what kind of recommendations we can make, because the, lunar, uh, the Google Lunar X Prize people came to NASA and said, what do we do? NASA does own the assets because they are, um, that's under the Outer Space Treaty. But the, their, the historic and science value of those sites is something that is definitely worth thinking about. Um, what do you treat as an artifact? Is it just hardware? Is it just historical hardware? What about space experiments that are still working? We still get actual data from the moon right now. Is a footprint, that iconic first footprint of Neil Armstrong, is that an, an artifact that you preserve? What would it take if somebody went up there and put their foot and says, OK, mom, take the picture now? <laughs> Scientists love to bring back materials to see how they have weathered in space weathering. We've got four decades worth of space weathering of equipment sitting up there, including lots of dust and stuff that have come across panels. So we can see a decrement of the data that's come over time. So we could actually start to correlate that to the, the changes that have occurred on the moon. Scientists would love to get the materials. We have a full inventory list of materials that are up there. It's really impressive, down to screws and cameras and everything else. And we could get data from that. Well, so too could someone from a Google Lunar X Prize. We can bring it back and compare them with stored materials, controlled stored materials that are still available at Johnson Space Center. And we can actually compare 40 years of data. We can go up and collect bags of diapers and stuff that were left underneath some of the uh, equipment and the, the lunar module when it launched. We have microbes in there. We know we've sent humans there. We know there's humans 
human waste up there. What can, what's happened to it in 40 years? That's great science. But so too, would someone, if someone went to the spacecraft and broke off a piece and brought it back and did something on eBay, oh, it doesn't sound right. And so it's government property. Does that make Alan Shepard's golf ball government property or not? So you can see the lawyers are going to have a good time with this one. Um, so what they did is said, let's take a look. What could be damaged? What are the disturbances that would be damaging? And what are the sites that are important? In the end, what they did is put, to get, put together a notebook that said how to protect and preserve these sites. And they built it around, decided to do bookends. All the sites in between weren't so important. Apollo 11, Apollo 17, the first and the last, were really important. They basically put a 50-meter boundary around the Apollo 11 site and said, don't go into it. Don't fly straight over it. Fly tangential to it. Um, just don't go. That's historical. And the Apollo 17, which is bigger, and the rovers and things, they set larger boundaries. And so that does work. But then the lawyers actually said, at one point when I talked about this, one lawyer said, who's... NASA to place boundaries around anything, no sovereignty. They own the asset, but they don't own the ground that it's on. And so they also said, well, we know that um, the biggest disturbance is the rocket exhaust coming in. And so the moon has a horizon of about 1.8 kilometers, so they suggested nobody land closer than two kilometers away. Terrific. And that's really nice, because you really minimize that uh, sand blasting that could happen. You could do a tremendous amount just from landing up here. Low speeds when you're near the assets because the wheels will kick up dust. Um, make sure you don't go into it any old which way once you go into a site. Um, and the other sites are OK to go into. And the other footprints and the other uh, rover tracks are OK to drive up to and do things on. Um, once you go into a site, have a regular road where you go in and out. Don't go into it from every which way. Um, make sure you remove your rovers or materials at the end of each day. So if your batteries die, you're outside the site. So there's ways you could do it. There's nothing, there's no requirements. And there's no enforcement up there. So this is a limited kind of participation. So then the second one is complications involving the ex ethics of extraterrestrial life. Outer Space Treaty works during exploration. It doesn't say anything about what to happen. Uh, it says to avoid interfering with the opportunity to explore, avoid adverse changes to Earth. Notice it doesn't even set it up to protect the moon or protect Mars. That's outside of the treaty. What if we find life? There's no policy for the discovery of life out there, and no ethical input on how to approve, how to approach life as we don't know it. We don't know if it's carbon chemistry. We don't know if it's related to us. It probably will be. So there was a workshop looking at Ethical Considerations in Planetary Protection. And that was held in 2010. Basically, they said, when we think about planetary protection, we've got it down. That's just fine. Planetary protection for science exploration won't change. What we need is a whole parallel policy that deals with these gaps in the treaty. And so what's happened is through time, people have continued to talk about it. And just this December, a group at the Space Policy Institute held a COSPAR, another workshop, on developing a responsible environmental regime for celestial bodies. And they said, we got to set the stage now. And we want to identify and clarify the questions that we're going to have to deal with. We don't know. What is harmful contamination up there? Everything we have here is harmful in terms of some biology, some physical uh, objects, some cultural or other historical artifacts. So we have a sense of what the criteria are, what is a good and right thing to do. What is it on the moon, which is just a big rock? What is it on Mars, which may be habitable but may not be? Um, what, is, what is the environment that needs protecting? Mars is an ecosystem that's constantly biogeochemically cycling. What is it up there? What is reasonable or practical? And can we look at other approaches that have been taken in international bodies, code of conducts, a, co a statement of environmental protection, a sense of uh, licenses? or penalties. You can name a whole variety of approaches that are done legally, but what would make sense up there? What timelines are there? Do you protect Mars forever or just for a while? Do we protect? So even on Earth, we say those kind of things. And what does it mean to have environmental stewardship? Again, our notions of stewardship and sustainability are based on what we know here. So we've got to do some study there, and the scientists will definitely go into uh, do a lot of input. 
We need to identify who the stakeholders are. I can just go onto the um, internet and come up with all these different folks who are planning activities, but the list gets very long. Um, what are the uses they plan? So who's going up there? What are they planning to do? How will or won't that interfere with science? And can we just establish an environmental database, especially about the resources that might need um, preservation or protection in some way? Some uh, a sense of what is environmentally damaging. Again, it's not an easy thing to set up based on the science that I, as a biologist, bring to the table. And what is contamination? Um, so we're really revisiting the Outer Space Treaty and using other legal regimes to help us think about what we want to do out there. But we're outside the box in many ways. So before, you can just see some of the things that we do if we think about Earth analogs to all of these. Um, we want to build on the Outer Space Treaty. We don't want to touch the important foundational element of that for international peace. But who should regulate and enforce? What kind of liability? So if someone ruins a site on the moon, what's money going to do down here on Earth? Um, do we have different sets of regulations on bodies without life or with life? What is stewardship or environmental management? Maybe you set aside areas like wilderness areas, national parks, but you can't have national parks because there's no sovereignty. What about rights and claims and management of those claims? Are there any areas that should be prohibited or treated as sacred? What is the value of them when value is usually set in terms of value to humans? And so you want to, you think about, we're also setting them, the face, space-faring nations are the ones that are setting these, and they're setting them at a time when new generations or <coughs> non-space-faring space -faring nations don't have access to even the discussions. How do you set them fairly? So where we are, we need to be systematic. We need to develop and update a new set of rules, rules of the road so that we can all go on our merry way and do our science. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, this is something for later. But look at the changes we've seen in the last 10 years and what's come along in astrobiology re research and Kepler um, and its discoveries. 10 years has meant a whole lot. And 10 years commercially has meant a whole lot. And even <coughs> NASA starting to think about using commercial spacecraft to get our own astronauts up to the station. So as we look ahead, what we are, we're really at a time of under construction, and we need to have a sense of a roadmap. Before we build something, usually it's good to know what you're going to build. We built something that was for five decades a really, really good treaty. We need to make sure that as we extend it, we don't extend it just piecemeal. We want to extend it with a framework that thinks about responsible exploration and use of outer space, balancing the different issues that people have. The policies have to go beyond just incremental, I think. We need to be proactive, and if the scientists don't figure out a way to get into it, I'm sure someone else, the lawyers and others, will think of ways to divvy things up. And we have to acknowledge that space science will share the environment with space commerce. It's just the way it'll be. So we're trying to look at how do you build a forward-looking framework that uses strong foundations from Earth, but it admits that there's lots of shortcomings. So I'd be happy to take questions. This is certainly not the average or typical SETI type of um, SETI Institute seminar, but these are issues that I think will come up beyond just the science and technology. Thanks for your attention. Mm -hmm. Margaret, could I uh, kick off the questions and I see yeah. we've got a few in the audience who want to pitch in too. Um, so if, if um, the UN wanted to uh, update uh, or add on to the Outer, uh, Outer Space Treaty, would they have to, uh, who would initiate that? Is there somebody responsible at the UN or is, the, is it a matter of the nation countries being led by the US or something? Uh, how would that happen? I'm, st I'm not a lawyer, so if anybody wants to correct me, feel free to. So the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space is the one that takes care of the treaty. Under that is a UN Office um, of uh, Space Operations and Space Activities, basically. And then COSPAR, which I always thought had this, you know, we're setting guidelines and policies and things. COSPAR is organized as a non-governmental organization. We're uh, we have long standing, and so we are an official, the Coast Bar is an official contributor to the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space since the late 50s. But in some ways, that makes us no different than the Sierra Club or any other advocacy group. 
So science that I always thought, it was until a few years ago, I realized we're outsiders. And so is everybody else. So this is a political game. This is governments and nations. But certainly, scientists and others do have a large say. And what goes on in Coast Bar is reported up to the United Nations. When planetary protection data are collected, when we go from pre-launch to end of mission, we report that information to the United Nations. So there's a, a great international cooperation and database of information. Uh, who can start it? Typically, nations and lawyers. And scientists are out in left field doing our science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> this may be well beyond the scope of what you're comfortable talking about, but um, the Mars One uh, mission, you said it wasn't a suicide mission, but I'm thinking about the, the biospheres and stuff. We even tried on Earth and couldn't make them succeed. Right. I just wonder what your thoughts are on the probability of them being, being successful at Okay, so the biosphere experiment he's talking about is one that was in uh, Arizona, still exists as an experiment. They tried to see could you have a completely self-contained um, environment, cycling and all, with people in it and with trees. And uh, it, even for two years they couldn't do it. And the people, the people interactions were very critical. So this 500-day mission to Mars that recently happened, they've been looking a lot at the psychological impacts and human behavior. But there are people that will tell you who were in that biosphere too long ago who still don't, they went in with as friends and they still don't talk to each other. So that's, an, that's another issue. But you're right. But it doesn't mean, so does it sound like we're not doing good environmental stewardship to go up to Mars and have a local area where we agree would have human con contamination? Um, that seems okay. That doesn't seem improper or unethical. Could you go and do it in a closed system? We've got good experience. Submarines go down, not for a long time, uh, Barosphere 2, and we're continuing to do that kind of work. And we do have resupply. So, uh, and so it, it's not going to be a big habitat. We won't have a New York City there for a long time. Um, and other people are talking terraforming. So could you be doing science in small areas? But then you've got biological contamination. So um, these are issues that have policy implications, practical implications, and perhaps ethical ones as well. Do I think it could work? As an experiment, sure. Experiments can fail. <laughs> and could the people survive? I bet they could. And do you have a, uh, a spacecraft ready for the return trip? I would bet you wouldn't do it up there without something like that, some ability to go back and forth. But I don't know. So Margaret, um, has the UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space yet agreed on a definition of space and outer space? But that's a, this is not a minor question. So um, as far as I know, I think we have a definition of where space starts and where aviation stops. But outer space, the way I don't, in looking at the treaty, I have not seen anything that is a definition. We can define planets. We can define moons. We can define all those other things. And we define them in scientific terms. Um, that's as far as we've gotten. Um, so, and I don't know that it matters because the treaty is clearly saying outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. So it just leaves it wide open. Hello. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. How does a space elevator fit into all this? And does a space elevator, being such a big, expensive thing, does it have the right to zap with lasers anything that threatens it? I would imagine that that one would be one of the issues taken, um, taken into account by commercial space users on Earth because it's a space elevator that leaves and returns to Earth. So in that way, it's outside of the scientific perspective, except for science on Earth. You know? So we're talking about damaging ecosystems or interfering with space travel or satellites or aircraft or environments. And so those are that's an Earth centric question. And like any other technology, you propose it and if it's proposed by an individual, um, it would be FAA or perhaps NASA that would look at it. Um, NASA doesn't have responsibility for the um, approvals of commercial activities. No one does right now. But uh, if NASA money was in it at all, then you would have to do environmental impact statements because that's the use of federal dollars and the National Environmental Policy Act would come into play. 
So someone would figure out how to get that one checked real quick. That's different than space elevators on other planets. Mm -hmm. um, oh, thank you. Oh, were you next? Okay. Oh, no, please. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, um, <clears throat> so basically this treaty <clears throat> is kind of a stopgap, was well, kind of a measurement, or so nobody's hijacking planets or no. taking over. Um, although there are people, so <clears throat> there's no way to stop them. So people will sell moon acres. I remember when I was in grad school at Berkeley, there was a guy that sold moon acres, and he'd come out in a spacesuit and sell you a piece of paper that gave you um, ownership of one acre of moon um, landscape. And he would laugh and say, uh, no, it wasn't worthless. He was giving you a big green paper in exchange for a little green paper. <laughs> it's a dollar bill. So that would be challenged in court. So he doesn't have ownership in order to give you a deed. But that doesn't stop people from naming planets and giving certificates out, too. So that is a minor issue. That is a minor issue. So people can do it. You can make money off of pet rocks if you want. So there's nothing illegal about it. And I would say that the space, the Outer Space Treaty is not just um, a stopgap. It's a really strong piece of legislation. Or I'm wondering, I'm hoping the people surrounding it I don't know. Well, commercial people really would love to go up there, and they are not keen on too much regulation, or they want regulation that's sensible and implementable. Mm -hmm. So you keep, you mentioned the fact that the scientists are kind of out here doing their thing, right? And they don't have a lot of power or control. But it seems to me that right now, the that really commercial sectors, governmental sectors, are really pretty dependent upon scientists and engineers who mm -hmm. have the ability to get out there. And right. I think one of the things that I can appreciate that you're doing is actually getting these people together to understand what power they may have and maybe proactively reach out to the, uh, the legal community and the commercial communities to try to get partnerships going in order to be in a good position to influence these laws. And I think I'm not going out there to get these people together. But I, I came in through planetary protection and began, I had a set of assumptions about it, which turned out to be many of them right and some of them wrong. And as I go forward, I realize, well, I can't get an answer to that one, or I would need someone else. Then I say, not that I get people together, but what is the organizational unit, the institution that's asking those questions, and how can I get scientific information in there? That's all I can do. And if I see gaps, I can't change it. I'm not an ethicist, so I can't look at foundational ethics under laws. I can gather information and hope I can convince an ethicist to look at it. Or I'm not a lawyer. So I would have to say, here's what the science is, and here's how we define ecosystems and environments on Earth. How does that apply to a different place? And I think some of the lawyers haven't looked at that yet. Okay, if you um, have any more questions, feel free to come up and talk to Margaret. Um, oh. Now, Margaret, this is a uh, special SETI mug. Uh, no planetary protection has been carried out on it, so you should be uh, just keeping okay. it in your office, I think, to be safe. That's right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for all your questions. Thanks. Thanks.